Well, friends, have you ever put your trust in something that wasn't secure? Uh, In recent years, with COVID affecting uh, so many different areas of our lives, uh, I'd be surprised if you hadn't. You know, our jobs and our livelihoods are no longer as secure as they once were, with so many of us losing jobs or, or not being able to work or even having our hours reduced. Our investments and our economy are no longer as secure as they once were, with so many of us losing assets that we thought would never be lost. And even our health and our families are no longer as secure as they once were, with so many of us getting sick or losing loved ones or experiencing the breakdown of relationships in lockdown. I mean, even this uh, recent roadmap out of lockdown that the New South Wales government has put forward, so many of us have already planned what we're going to do in the next few weeks. We're going to see if we can visit family. But again, we're putting our trust that everything will go to plan. And the truth is, it can be taken away from us all in the blink of an eye. I mean, it's happened to us before, hasn't it? Friends, everywhere we look, everything seems to be so uncertain. The ground seems to be crumbling around us. Is there nothing that we can be sure about anymore? Is there no safe or secure ground for us to rest on? Friends, where do you find true security? Well, Psalm 46, the psalm we're going to be looking at today, is the answer to this question. In a world where everything is crumbling, there is only one thing that is stable. Where everything else is temporary, only one thing is eternal. And friends, that is God. The songwriter of Psalm 46 tells us that God alone is the one in whom we find true security. Psalm 46 gives us a picture of what it looks like to find refuge in God alone. And so as we take a look at the psalm now, we're going to see that as we take refuge in God, God's people have security against nature, security in the city, and security amongst the nations. Uh, Those are going to be my three main points for today. And uh, if you're following along in the outline, we're at uh, point one now, uh, security against nature. And so let's start at verse one, verse one of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Well, friends, as we take a look at the first stanza, the first kind of few verses of this song, we see uh, that the first verse kind of acts like a topic sentence, a summary of the entire psalm. You see, this is a psalm about God. It's about God's power and God's strength. But it's not just about God. It's a song about how God relates to his people. God is the refuge and strength for the ancient people of Israel. Uh, the the, The way the writer describes God here is the way one would describe an indestructible and insurmountable building Something like the fortress that you can see there. Something that no matter how hard you try and how much power you put into it, you can never overcome it. That's what God is like. A rock-solid fortress that no one can ever destroy. But more than that, the writer of this psalm tells us that God is an ever-present help in trouble. You see, as indestructible and as powerful as God is, He is not distant from us. He is not distant from his people. He does not leave his people to weather the storms of life alone. No, God is with his people. He provides help and comfort to them in really tough times. And friends, this is a wonderful truth for us to be reminded of. You see, it's one thing for God to be all-powerful and indestructible, but if he was all that, but he wasn't for his people, if God was all-powerful but wasn't all good and he didn't care about us, uh, or worse yet, he was against us, 
Well, friends, that would be terrifying. But the songwriter tells us here that that's not the case. God is both all-powerful and all-good. God is the refuge for his people. God is present with them, even when things go terribly wrong. And so in light of this, the writer tells us that God's people don't need to be afraid. We can take courage even in the worst possible experiences of life because God is with us. And it's interesting, in this psalm, the writer actually goes through to describe some of the worst things you can experience in life. In verse 2, it seems like the writer describes something similar to that of an earthquake. I mean, you could just imagine it, right? I mean, there's a picture there to show the devastation of an earthquake. But there it is. The earth crumbles and gives way beneath your feet. The massive mountains split in two and begin falling into the oceans. It's a terrifying experience of when nature turns around and pulls the rug from right out under our feet. And in verse 3, the image gets even worse. You see, if it wasn't enough that the land doesn't provide safe haven, well, the seas are even worse. And again, what we see here is something like a massive tsunami. And you can just imagine it again. Chaotic, colossal water standing over us. What remains of the mountain are crumbling and fighting beneath the sea. Huge, towering waves crashing over everything. The seas roar and they foam as though they're alive and they come to drown all of life in its waters. You see, friends, this is a paralyzing and hopeless experience. These are two of the most horrible and chaotic forces that nature can throw at us. In the face of the worst calamities that nature can throw, the psalmist tells us that we do not need to fear. God's people don't need to be afraid. Why? Because God is king over all of nature. The one who made the heavens and the earth will never lose control. He will not be overcome. When literally all other ground crumbles beneath our feet, God's people can know for certain that God will never crumble. He is our permanent shelter in the midst of the storm. And so, friends, can I say we can take heart from this. This is meant to give great comfort to us. In the midst of the worst experiences that nature can throw at us, we can find refuge in God. Whether we're fighting against blazing bushfires or flashing floods or even a horrible pandemic, we can find comfort in God. When we feel as though the ground beneath our feet is crumbling away, we can know that God is our refuge and strength. He is an ever-present help in trouble. And so, friends, let's take comfort and turn our mind to the God who is our refuge. Let's find comfort in God. Well, as the songwriter continues, he makes a kind of uh, sudden shift in tone. Uh, He moves from the chaos of a tsunami on one hand to the peaceful streams of a river on the other. And this river that he begins to describe, it gives life to the city of God. And so we're at point two now, security in the city. Uh, Let's pick up the psalm again from verse four. Verse four. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, friends, in this second stanza of the song, the writer moves from chaos to calm. He starts to show us a picture of a safe and secure city. And in verse 4, we see that this 
picture of this beautiful city, and and you can just imagine it, right? Again, reading these verses. It's a city which is given life by peaceful streams from a river. It's a city full of life and gladness, a, a city that belongs to God himself. Now, of course, the writer is referring to the city of Jerusalem. He uses language here in the way that he describes Jerusalem that remembers the Garden of Eden. Beauty, life, the presence of God himself. This is what Genesis 1 and 2 describes, you know, what the world was like before sin came into the world. In fact, the picture here is better than the garden. This is the city where God dwells securely with his people forever. You couldn't ask for a more peaceful scene than this. But interestingly enough, the scene outside the city is so different to what it's like inside. Inside the city is peaceful, calm and quiet. On the outside, you see things turning badly. Uh, Take a look at verse 6. Verse 6. Though the city is safe inside, the threat of war exists outside. Like the earthquake and the tsunami that rages in the first scene, we see uh, the nations, the enemies of God, raging against this city. You see, the nations are angry. They're out for blood. And they're coming against God's city and against God's people. Uh, It's so safe and quaint in the city, but it's chaotic and uh, dangerous outside. But even here, God is the one who is still in charge. Even though the nations rage against the city, God is still the city's help. And so in verse 5, God is the one who helps this city. In verse 6, God's voice causes the nations to fall. You see, God's words are powerful enough to cause even the toughest nation to melt away. And so friends, the main point here is a simple one. God's people are safe and secure in God's city because God is with them. In the chorus of this song, uh, in verse 7, the writer sums up the message of the whole psalm. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, friends, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God who has made promises to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, this God dwells in his city with his people. And so nothing can stand against us. If God's people are in God's city with him, then nothing can touch them. Nothing can bring this city down. Now what I think is interesting is that uh, in the recent months, we've seen the opposite of what these verses say. Uh, In world news, we've seen a city which has no security. We've seen a city overcome not by peace, but by conflict. We've seen a city where people are terrified for their own safety. And friends, of course, I'm talking about the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. A city where many of us have family and friends who are afraid of what the future holds a city where people are overrun and overcome by the forces of the Taliban. You see, the people of this city, they've known terrible fighting and pain. They've known corruption and death. And even though our cities are different to Kabul, in some way or another, this experience resonates with us all. Even our city, the city of Sydney, one of the greatest in the world, is not free from corruption and fighting. And we've seen a little of that in recent times as well. And so, friends, this song reminds us that our hope is not in the city of Kabul. Our hope is not in the city of Tokyo or the city of London or Washington or even in the great city of Sydney. Friends, our hope is in the city of God. In the New Testament, the book of Revelation shows us that God's people belong to the city of the New Jerusalem. Those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are forgiven and washed in his blood, they belong to this city 
where God dwells perfectly with his people. This is the true city, free from conflict and corruption. The city filled with gladness and life. And so friends, as Jesus' people now, we're meant to look to do good to our city. We're meant to be good citizens of where we live at the moment. But ultimately, this psalm calls us to look forward to our true home. And so friends, how much do you long for the new Jerusalem? How long, how much do you long for your true home? Well, as the songwriter reaches the end of his song, uh, the scene shifts once again. Uh, This time it moves from a life-filled city uh, to a ravaged battlefield. Uh, It's here in this battlefield that we're going to see God's power over the nations. And so we're at point three now, uh, security among the nations. Uh, Let's pick it up from verse eight. Verse eight. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, friends, the writer begins the last stanza of this song with a call to come and see God's mighty works. He invites everyone to come and take a look. Come and see the desolations that God has brought to the earth. You can feel that little bit of a change of tone here again. We're moving from a city at peace to what gets described as God's desolations. These are God's astonishing works, his powerful activity over the nations. It feels like it has a negative kind of tone, these desolations, but actually they get described in terms of peace. Take a look at verse 9. Verse 9, the desolations of God is the end of all world wars. This is the end of all conflict amongst humanity. This is true and lasting peace finally come over the whole world. And the songwriter describes a battlefield after an awesome fight. True and lasting peace has been achieved, but it's only come after an overwhelming confrontation, after an overwhelming battle. And the peace that gets described here is so absolute, so certain, that all the weapons of war in the world are destroyed. Again, you can just imagine what this looks like, right? Broken bows and arrows lying on the ground, shattered and splintered spears everywhere, shields and chariots burning with fire. It's a violent picture, but it's a picture of peace, a picture of a total defeat of the enemy. Uh, Maybe the modern example would be like looking at a war zone after a battle. Guns and artillery are all torn in half, lying around. Smoke is rising from burning cars and tanks and drones. Fighter jets are left lying in pieces on the ground, no longer able to be used. You see, friends, there is total security for God's people because all of God's enemies are now gone. This is a picture of what God promises will happen at the end. When the Lord Jesus returns to judge the heavens and the earth, the living and the dead, this is what will happen. Total and complete victory. Total and complete peace. And in verse 10, we kind of hear God speak for the very first time in this song. God speaks and he says directly to his people, he tells them to be still. Be still and know that I am God. Friends, these are wonderfully comforting words. And I think sometimes they've been taken uh, and been said to mean something different to what they actually mean. It's not really uh, meant to say, you know, don't do anything. 
The, the point of these words here, to be still and know that I am God, is about not being afraid. It's about not being anxious. It means that you don't need to fear those who are against God. Instead, remember, know that God is the one who is in control. Remember that God is our refuge and ever-present help in trouble. And to help with this, God shows how things will be in the end. After the war is won, after the battle is finished, what will it be like? Well, God describes it here. You see, we may not know what tomorrow holds, but God does. God knows what tomorrow will be like. God knows what next year will be like. And here, God describes what the end of all things will be like. In the end, God will be exalted. God's name will be lifted up. God will be praised. He'll be honoured. He'll be glorified amongst all the nations of the world. You see, friends, in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yahweh, that our Lord Jesus is God, that he is Lord. In the end, we will see worldwide worship of the one true and living God. And so, as we await for God's appointed end to come, what does God call us to do? How are we to live? Well, the answer there is in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Friends, God's people are called to trust him. We're called to look forward to God's final victory. We're called to find our security in him. You know, it can be really hard to do this when it feels like the world is out to get God's people. I mean, what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment has been horrible for everyone there, but it's been particularly bad for God's people. Christians are being targeted in brutal ways. Uh, it was about a month ago now that I heard of pastors in Afghanistan receiving messages saying that they were being watched and that they will be hunted down. And friends, closer to home, it feels like following Jesus is harder than ever. We face mockery, hostility, and opposition. It feels like the world just goes from bad to worse. But in the face of all of this, the songwriter tells us to turn to God. You see, the answer isn't to worry ourselves to death, but we're to find our security and stability in the one who holds all things in his hands. You see, God's plans aren't dependent on how Christians are being treated around the world at the moment. God's plans aren't dependent on how we are treated here and now. Instead, God's plans are final. Every knee will bow before Jesus. God has said it, and it will come to pass. And so, friends, will you find your security in God, in his promised future of peace? Will you rest in God's control over all things? Uh, well, friends, we started our time together by asking the question of where we do find our security. And Psalm 46 has shown us, has reminded us that God alone is the only stable ground in the midst of a world of uncertainty. God alone is to be our security. But what does that look like? What does it mean to have God as our refuge and strength? And I think the example of one man stands out to me, and that's of the great German reformer Martin Luther. Uh, Luther lived in the 17th century and he faced many a hardship during his life. He knew opposition, he knew depression, he knew grief and famine and plague. In the midst of all of this, though, he trusted that Jesus was in control. And so in October, October 1527, when the plague was approaching his homeland, Luther wrote his most famous song, a hymn 
based on the words that we've been reflecting on today, based on the words of Psalm 46. And so to end our time together, I want us to read and reflect on these beautiful words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our shelter he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Friends, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Luther entrusted himself to the God that he knew was his refuge till his dying day. May God grant us to do the same. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We thank you that while the world might feel so unstable, while things might crumble under our feet, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has conquered death has risen to new life and now reigns on the throne. Father, we thank you that while things can be uncertain for us at the moment, we can find refuge in you and find refuge in our Lord Jesus. We pray that you would help us to live as those who find refuge in you. As we go about our lives, Father, as we go to work, as we study, as we relate to those around us, help us to be those who show this unshakable faith in the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, we'll be those who are always ready to share this eternal security that's found in you. And gracious Father, we pray that so many more people, so many more people in our city, in our country, in our world would know Jesus and would follow him, and that they would find their refuge in you. We pray that you would do this mighty work in us and in the world, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.